The Story of Prince Ahmed and the Fairy Parabanu II From the Blue Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang When Prince Ahmed came pretty nigh to these rocks, he perceived an arrow, which he gathered up, looked earnestly at it, and was in the greatest astonishment to find it was the same he shot away. Certainly, said he to himself, neither I nor any man living could shoot an arrow so far, and, finding it laid flat, not sticking into the ground, he judged that it had rebounded against the rock. There must be some mystery in this, said he to himself again, and it may be advantageous to me, perhaps fortune to make me amends for depriving me of what I had thought the greatest happiness may have reserved a greater blessing for my comfort. As these rocks were full of caves, and some of those caves were deep, the prince entered into one, and, looking about, cast his eyes on an iron door which seemed to have no lock, but he feared it was fastened. However, thrusting against it, it opened, and discovered an easy descent, but no steps, which he walked down with his arrow in his hand. At first he thought he was going into a dark, obscure place, but presently a quite different light succeeded that which he came out of, and, entering into a large, spacious place at about fifty or sixty paces distant, he perceived a magnificent palace, which he had not then time enough to look at. At the same time, a lady of majestic port and air advanced as far as the porch, attended by a large troop of ladies, so finely dressed and beautiful that it was difficult to distinguish which was the mistress. As soon as Prince Ahmed perceived the lady, he made all imaginable haste to go and pay his respects, and the lady, on her part seeing him coming, prevented him from addressing his discourse to her first, but said to him, "'Come near, Prince Ahmed, you are welcome.' It was no small surprise to the prince to hear himself named in a place he had never heard of, though so nigh to his father's capital, and he could not comprehend how he should be known to a lady who was a stranger to him. At last he returned the lady's compliment by throwing himself at her feet and rising up again, said to her, "'Madam, I return you a thousand thanks for the assurance you give me of a welcome to a place where I believed my imprudent curiosity had made me penetrate too far. But, madam, "'May I, without being guilty of ill manners, dare to ask you by what adventure you know me? "'And how you, who live in the same neighbourhood with me, should be so great a stranger to me?' "'Prince,' said the lady, "'let us go into the hall. There I will gratify you in your request.' "'After these words, the lady led Prince Ahmed into the hall. "'Then she sat down on a sofa, and, when the prince, by her entreaty, had done the same, she said—' "'You are surprised, you say, that I should know you and not be known by you, "'but you will no longer be surprised when I inform you who I am. "'You are undoubtedly sensible that your religion teaches you to believe "'that the world is inhabited by genies as well as men. "'I am the daughter of one of the most powerful and distinguished genies, "'and my name is Parabanu. "'The only thing that I have to add is that you seemed to me worthy of a more happy fate than that of possessing the Princess Nuranahar, and that you might attain to it. I was present when you drew your arrow, and foresaw it would not go beyond Prince Hossein's. I took it in the air, and gave it the necessary motion to strike against the rocks near which you found it, and I tell you that it lies in your power to make use of the favorable opportunity which presents itself to make you happy. As the fairy Parabanu pronounced these last words with a different tone, and looked at the same time tenderly upon Prince Ahmed, with a modest blush on her cheeks, it was no hard matter for the prince to comprehend what happiness she meant. He presently considered that the princess Nuranahar could never be his, and that the fairy Parabanu excelled her infinitely in beauty, agreeableness, wit, and, as much as he could conjecture by the magnificence of the palace, in immense riches." He blessed the moment that he thought of seeking after his arrow a second time, and yielding to his love. Madam, replied he, should I all my life have the happiness of being your slave, and the admirer of the many charms which ravish my soul, I should think myself the most blessed of men. Pardon in me the boldness which inspires me to ask this favor, and don't refuse to admit me into your court, a prince who is entirely devoted to you. Prince, answered the fairy, will you not pledge your faith to me, "'as well as I give mine to you?' "'Yes, madam,' replied the prince in an ecstasy of joy. "'What can I do better and with greater pleasure?' "'Yes, my sultaness, my queen, "'I'll give you my heart without the least reserve.' "'Then,' answered the fairy, "'you are my husband, and I am your wife. "'But, 
as I suppose, pursued she, that you have eaten nothing today, a slight repast shall be served up for you while preparations are making for our wedding feast at night. And then I will show you the apartments of my palace, and you shall judge if this hall is not the meanest part of it. Some of the fairy's women, who came into the hall with them and guessed her intentions, went immediately out and returned presently with some excellent meats and wines. When Prince Ahmed had ate and drunk as much as he cared for, the fairy Parabanu carried him through all the apartments where he saw diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and all sorts of fine jewels, intermixed with pearls, agate, jasper, porphyry, and all sorts of the most precious marbles. But not to mention the richness of the furniture, which was inestimable, there was such a profuseness throughout that the prince, instead of ever having seen anything like it, owned that he could not have imagined that there was anything in the world that could come up to it. Prince, said the fairy, if you admire my palace so much, which, indeed, is very beautiful, what would you say to the palaces of the chief of our genies, which are much more beautiful, spacious, and magnificent? I could also charm you with my gardens, but we will let that alone till another time. Night draws near, and it will be time to go to supper. The next hall which the fairy led the prince into, and where the cloth was laid for the feast, was the last apartment the prince had not seen, and not in the least inferior to the others. At his entrance into it he admired the infinite number of sconces of wax candles perfumed with amber, the multitude of which, instead of being confused, were placed with so just a symmetry as formed an agreeable and pleasant sight. A large side-table was set out with all sorts of gold plate, so finely wrought that the workmanship was much more valuable than the weight of the gold. Several choruses of beautiful women richly dressed and whose voices were ravishing began a concert, accompanied with all sorts of the most harmonious instruments, and when they were set down at table, the fairy Parabanu took care to help Prince Ahmed to the most delicate meats, which she named as she invited him to eat of them, and which the prince found to be so exquisitely nice that he commended them with exaggeration and said that the entertainment far surpassed those of man. He found also the same excellence in the wines which neither he nor the fairy tasted of till the dessert was served up, which consisted of the choicest sweetmeats and fruits. The wedding feast was continued the next day, or rather, the days following the celebration were a continual feast. At the end of six months, Prince Ahmed, who always loved and honored the sultan his father, conceived a great desire to know how he was, and that desire could not be satisfied without his going to see. He told the fairy of it, and desired she would give him leave. Prince, said she, go when you please, but first, don't take it amiss that I give you some advice how you shall behave yourself where you are going. First, I don't think it proper for you to tell the sultan your father of our marriage, nor of my quality, nor the place where you have been. Beg of him to be satisfied in knowing you are happy, and desire no more, and let him know that the sole end of your visit is to make him easy, and inform him of your fate. She appointed twenty gentlemen, well mounted and equipped, to attend him. When all was ready, Prince Ahmed took his leave of the fairy, embraced her, and renewed his promise to return soon. Then his horse, which was most finely caparisoned, and was as beautiful a creature as any in the sultan of Indy's stables, was led to him, and he mounted him with an extraordinary grace, and, after he had bid her a last adieu, set forward on his journey. As it was not a great way to his father's capital, Prince Ahmed soon arrived there. The people, glad to see him again, received him with acclamations of joy, and followed him in crowds to the sultan's apartment. The sultan received and embraced him with great joy, complaining at the same time with a fatherly tenderness of the affliction his long absence had been to him, which, he said, was the more grievous for that, fortune having decided in favor of Prince Ali, his brother, he was afraid he might have committed some rash action. The prince told a story of his adventures without speaking of the fairy, whom he said that he must not mention, and ended, "'The only favor I ask of your majesty is to give me leave to come often and pay you my respects.' and to know how you do. Son, answered the Sultan of the Indies, I cannot refuse you the leave you ask me, but I should much rather you would resolve to stay with me. At least tell me where I may send to you if you should fail to come, or when I may think your presence necessary. Sir, replied Prince Ahmed, 
what your majesty asks of me is part of the mystery I spoke to your majesty of. I beg of you to give me leave to remain silent on this head, for I shall come so frequently that I am afraid that I shall sooner be thought troublesome than be accused of negligence in my duty. The Sultan of the Indies pressed Prince Ahmed no more, but said to him, Son, I penetrate no farther into your secrets, but leave you at your liberty, but can tell you that you could not do me a greater pleasure than to come and by your presence restore to me the joy I have not felt this long time, and that you shall always be welcome when you come, without interrupting your business or pleasure. Prince Ahmed stayed but three days at the Sultan his father's court, and the fourth returned to the fairy Parabanu, who did not expect him so soon. A month after Prince Ahmed's return from paying a visit to his father, as the fairy Parabanu had observed that the prince, since the time that he had given her an account of his journey, his discourse with his father, and the leave he asked to go and see him often, had never talked to the sultan, as if there had been no such person in the world, whereas before he was always speaking of him, she thought he forbear on her account, therefore she took an opportunity to say to him one day, "'Prince, tell me, have you forgotten the sultan your father? Don't you remember the promise you made to go and see him often?' For my part, I have not forgotten what you told me at your return, and so put you in mind of it, that you may not be long before you acquit yourself of your promise. So, Prince Ahmed went the next morning with the same attendance as before, but much finer, and himself more magnificently mounted, equipped, and dressed, and was received by the Sultan with the same joy and satisfaction. For several months he constantly paid his visits, always in a richer and finer equipage. At last some wazirs, the sultan's favorites, who judged of Prince Ahmed's grandeur and power by the figure he cut, made the sultan jealous of his son, saying it was to be feared he might inveigle himself into the people's favor and dethrone him. The sultan of the Indies was so far from thinking that Prince Ahmed could be capable of so pernicious a design as his favorites would make him believe that he said to them, "'You are mistaken. My son loves me, and I am certain of his tenderness and fidelity, as I have given him no reason to be disgusted.' But the favorites went on abusing Prince Ahmed till the sultan said, "'Be it as it will, I don't believe my son Ahmed is so wicked as you would persuade me he is. However, I am obliged to you for your good advice, and don't dispute but that it proceeds from your good intentions.' The sultan of the Indies said this that his favorites might not know the impressions their discourse had made on his mind, which had so alarmed him that he resolved to have Prince Ahmed watched unknown to his grand wazir. So he sent for a female magician who was introduced by a back door into his apartment. Go immediately, he said, and follow my son, and watch him so well as to find out where he retires, and bring me word. The magician left the sultan, and knowing the place where Prince Ahmed found his arrow, went immediately thither, and hid herself near the rocks, so that nobody could see her. The next morning Prince Ahmed set out by daybreak, without taking leave either of the sultan or any of his court, according to custom, the magician, seeing him coming, followed him with her eyes till on a sudden she lost sight of him and his attendants. As the rocks were very steep and craggy, they were an insurmountable barrier, so that the magician judged that there were but two things for it, either that the prince retired into some cavern or an abode of genies or fairies. Thereupon she came out of the place where she was hid and went directly to the hollow way which she traced till she came to the farther end, looking carefully about on all sides. But, notwithstanding all her diligence, could perceive no opening, not so much as the iron gate which Prince Ahmed discovered, which was to be seen and open to none but men, and only to such whose presence was agreeable to the fairy Parabanu. The magician, who saw it was in vain for her to search any farther, was obliged to be satisfied with the discovery she had made, and returned to give the sultan an account. The sultan was very well pleased with the magician's conduct, and said to her, "'Do you as you think fit.' I await patiently the event of your promises, and to encourage her made her a present of a diamond of great value. As Prince Ahmed had obtained the fairy Parabanu's leave to go to the Sultan of the Indies' court once a month, he never failed, and the magician, knowing the time, went a day or two before to the foot of the rock where she lost sight of the prince and his attendants, and waited there. The next morning Prince Ahmed went out as usual at the iron gate with the same attendants as before, and passed by the magician, whom he knew not to be such, and, seeing her lie with her head against the rock, and complaining as if she were in great pain, he pitied her, turned his horse about, went to her, and asked her what was the matter with her, and what he could do to ease her. 
The artful sorceress looked at the prince in a pitiful manner, without ever lifting up her head, and answered in broken words and sighs, as if she could hardly fetch her breath, that she was going to the capital city, but on the way thither she was taken with so violent a fever that her strength failed her, and she was forced to lie down where he saw her, far from any habitation, and without any hopes of assistance. "'Good woman,' replied Prince Ahmed, "'you are not so far from help as you imagine. I am ready to assist you and convey you where you will meet with a speedy cure. Only get up and let one of my people take you behind him.' At these words, the magician, who pretended sickness only to know where the prince lived and what he did, refused not the charitable offer he made her, and, that her actions might correspond with her words, she made many pretended vain endeavors to get up. At the same time, two of the prince's attendants, alighting off their horses, helped her up, and set her behind another, and mounted their horses again, and followed the prince, who turned back to the iron gate, which was opened by one of his retinue who rode before. And when he came into the outward court of the ferry, without dismounting himself, he sent to tell her he wanted to speak with her. The ferry Parabanu came with all imaginable haste, not knowing what made Prince Ahmed return so soon, who, not giving her time to ask him the reason, said, "'Princess, I desire you would have compassion on this good woman,' pointing to the magician who was held up by two of his retinue. "'I found her in the condition you see her in, and promised her the assistance she stands in need of,' and am persuaded that you, out of your own goodness, as well as upon my entreaty, will not abandon her. The fairy, Parabanu, who had her eyes fixed upon the pretended sick woman all the time that the prince was talking to her, ordered two of her women who followed her to take her from the two men that held her, and carry her into an apartment of the palace, and take as much care of her as she would herself. While the two women executed the fairy's commands, she went up to Prince Ahmed, and, whispering in his ear, said, Prince, this woman is not so sick as she pretends to be, and I am very much mistaken if she is not an impostor who will be the cause of great trouble to you. But don't be concerned. Let what will be devised against you. Be persuaded that I will deliver you out of all the snares that shall be laid for you. Go and pursue your journey. This discourse of the fairies did not in the least frighten Prince Ahmed. My princess, said he, as I do not remember I ever did or designed anybody an injury, I cannot believe anybody can have a thought of doing me one. But if they have, I shall not nevertheless forbear doing good whenever I have an opportunity. Then he went back to his father's palace. In the meantime, the two women carried the magician into a very fine apartment, richly furnished. First they sat her down upon a sofa with her back supported with a cushion of gold brocade, while they made a bed on the same sofa before her, the quilt of which was finely embroidered with silk, the sheets of the finest linen, and the coverlet cloth of gold. When they had put her into bed, for the old sorceress pretended that her fever was so violent she could not help herself in the least, one of the women went out and returned soon again with a china dish in her hand full of a certain liquor which she presented to the magician while the other helped her to sit up. "'Drink this liquor,' said she. "'It is the water of the fountain of lions, "'and a sovereign remedy against all fevers whatsoever. "'You will find the effect of it in less than an hour's time.' "'The magician, to dissemble the better, "'took it after a great deal of entreaty, "'but at last she took the china dish, "'and holding back her head, swallowed down the liquor. "'When she was laid down again, the two women covered her up. "'Lie quiet,' said she who brought her the china cup, "'and get a little sleep if you can.' We'll leave you and hope to find you perfectly cured when we come again an hour hence. The two women came again at the time they said they should, and found the magician up and dressed and sitting upon the sofa. Oh, admirable potion, she said, it has wrought its cure much sooner than you told me it would, and I shall be able to prosecute my journey. The two women, who were fairies as well as their mistress, after they had told the magician how glad they were that she was cured so soon, walked before her and conducted her through several apartments, all more noble than that wherein she lay, into a large hall, the most richly and magnificently furnished of all the palace. Fairy Parabanu sat in this hall on a throne of massive gold, enriched with diamonds, rubies, and pearls of an extraordinary size, and attended on each hand by a great number of beautiful fairies, all richly clothed. At the sight of so much majesty, the magician was not only dazzled, but was so amazed that, after she had prostrated herself before the throne, she could not open her lips to thank the fairy as she proposed. However, Parabanu saved her the trouble, and said to her, "'Good woman,' I am glad I had an opportunity to oblige you, 
and to see you are able to pursue your journey. I won't detain you, but perhaps you may not be displeased to see my palace. Follow my women, and they will show it to you. Then the magician went back and related to the Sultan of the Indies all that had happened and how very rich Prince Ahmed was since his marriage with the fairy, richer than all the kings in the world, and how there was danger that he should come and take the throne from his father. Though the Sultan of the Indies was very well persuaded that Prince Ahmed's natural disposition was good, yet he could not help being concerned at the discourse of the old sorceress, to whom, when she was taking her leave, he said, I thank thee for the pains thou hast taken, and thy wholesome advice. I am so sensible of the great importance it is to me that I shall deliberate upon it in council. Now, the favorites advised that the prince should be killed, but the magician advised differently. Make him give you all kinds of wonderful things, by the fairy's help, till she tires of him and sends him away. As, for example, every time your majesty goes into the field, you are obliged to be at a great expense, not only in pavilions and tents for your army, but likewise in mules and camels to carry their baggage. Now, might not you engage him to use his interest with the fairy to procure you a tent which might be carried in a man's hand, and which should be so large as to shelter your whole army against bad weather? When the magician had finished her speech, the sultan asked his favorites if they had anything better to propose, and, finding them all silent, determined to follow the magician's advice as the most reasonable and most agreeable to his mild government. Next day, the sultan did as the magician had advised him, and asked for the pavilion. Prince Ahmed never expected that the sultan his father would have asked such a thing, which at first appeared so difficult, not to say impossible, Though he knew not absolutely how great the power of genies and fairies was, he doubted whether it extended so far as to compass such a tent as his father desired. At last he replied, Though it is with the greatest reluctance imaginable, I will not fail to ask the favor of my wife your majesty desires, but will not promise you to obtain it, and if I should not have the honor to come again to pay you my respects, that shall be the sign that I have not had success. But beforehand... I desire you to forgive me, and consider that you yourself have reduced me to this extremity. Son, replied the Sultan of the Indies, I should be very sorry if what I ask of you should cause me the displeasure of never seeing you more. I find you don't know the power a husband has over a wife, and yours would show her that her love to you was very indifferent if she, with the power she has of a fairy, should refuse you so trifling a request as this I desire you to ask of her for my sake." The prince went back, and was very sad for fear of offending the fairy. She kept pressing him to tell her what was the matter, and at last he said, "'Madam, you may have observed that hitherto I have been content with your love, and have never asked you any other favor. Consider, then, I conjure you, that it is not I, but the sultan my father, who indiscreetly, or at least I think so, begs of you a pavilion large enough to shelter him, his court, and army from the violence of the weather, and which a man may carry in his hand. But remember, it is the sultan my father asks this favor. Prince, replied the fairy, smiling, I am sorry that so small a matter should disturb you, and make you so uneasy as you appeared to me. Then the fairy sent for her treasurer, to whom, when she came, she said, Norghan, which was her name, bring me the largest pavilion in my treasury. Norgam returned presently with the pavilion, which she could not only hold in her hand, but in the palm of her hand when she shut her fingers, and presented it to her mistress, who gave it to Prince Ahmed to look at. When Prince Ahmed saw the pavilion which the fairy called the largest in her treasury, he fancied she had a mind to jest with him, and thereupon the marks of his surprise appeared presently in his countenance, which Perabanu perceived burst out laughing. "'What, prince?' cried she. "'Do you think I jest with you? You'll see presently that I am in earnest. Norgan,' said she to her treasurer, taking the tent out of Prince Ahmed's hands, "'go and set it up, that the prince may judge whether it may be large enough for the sultan his father.' The treasurer went immediately with it out of the palace, and carried it a great way off, and when she had set it up, one end reached to the very palace, at which time the prince, thinking it small, found it large enough to shelter two greater armies than that of the sultan his fathers, and then said to Parabanu, "'I ask my princess a thousand pardons for my incredulity, after what I have seen and believe there is nothing impossible to you.' 
"'You see,' said the fairy, "'that the pavilion is larger than what your father may have occasion for, "'for you must know that it has one property, "'that it is larger or smaller according to the army it is to cover.' The treasurer took down the tent again, and brought it to the prince who took it, and without staying any longer than till the next day, mounted his horse, and went with the same attendance to the sultan his father. The sultan, who was persuaded that there could not be any such thing as such a tent as he asked for, was in great surprise at the prince's diligence. He took the tent, and after he had admired its smallness, his amazement was so great that he could not recover himself. When the tent was set up in the great plain which we have before mentioned, he found it large enough to shelter an army twice as large as he could bring into the field. But the sultan was not yet satisfied. Son, said he, I have already expressed to you how much I am obliged to you for the present of the tent you have procured me, that I look upon it as the most valuable thing in all my treasury. But you must do one thing more for me, which will be every whit as agreeable to me. I am informed that the fairy, your spouse, makes use of a certain water called the water of the fountain of lions, which cures all sorts of fevers, even the most dangerous, and, as I am perfectly well persuaded my health is dear to you, I don't doubt but you will ask her for a bottle of that water for me, and bring it to me as a sovereign medicine, which I may make use of when I have occasion. Do me this other important piece of service, and thereby complete the duty of a good son toward a tender father." The prince returned and told the fairy what his father had said. "'There's a great deal of wickedness in this demand,' she answered, "'as you will understand by what I am going to tell you. "'The Fountain of Lions is situated in the middle of a court of a great castle, "'the entrance into which is guarded by four fierce lions, two of which sleep alternately, while the other two are awake. "'But don't let that frighten you. "'I'll give you means to pass by them without any danger.' The fairy Parabanu was at that time very hard at work, and as she had several clues of thread by her, she took up one, and presenting it to Prince Ahmed, said, First take this clue of thread. I'll tell you presently the use of it. In the second place, you must have two horses. One you must ride yourself, and the other you must lead, which must be loaded with a sheep cut into four quarters that must be killed today. In the third place, you must be provided with a bottle, which I will give you to bring the water in. "'Set out early tomorrow morning, and when you have passed the iron gate, "'throw the clue of thread before you, which will roll till it comes to the gates of the castle. "'Follow it, and when it stops, as the gates will be open, "'you will see the four lions. "'The two that are awake will by their roaring wake the other two. "'But don't be frightened. "'Throw each of them a quarter of mutton, "'and then clap spurs to your horse and ride to the fountain. "'Fill your bottle without a lighting, and then return with the same expedition. "'The lions will be so busy eating.' They will let you pass by them. Prince Ahmed set out the next morning at the time appointed by the fairy, and followed her directions exactly. When he arrived at the gates of the castle, he distributed the quarters of mutton among the four lions, and passing through the midst of them bravely, got to the fountain, filled his bottle, and returned back as safe and sound as he went. When he had gone a little distance from the castle gates, He turned him about, and perceiving two of the lions coming after him, he drew his saber and prepared himself for defense. But as he went forward, he saw one of them turned out of the road at some distance, and showed by his head and tail that he did not come to do him any harm, but only to go before him, and that the other stayed behind to follow. He put his sword up again in its scabbard. Guarded in this manner, he arrived at the capital of the Indies, but the lions never left him till they had conducted him to the gates of the sultan's palace after which they returned the same way they came, though not without frightening all that saw them, for all they went in a very gentle manner and showed no fierceness. A great many officers came to attend the prince while he dismounted his horse, and afterward conducted him into the sultan's apartment, who was at that time surrounded with his favorites. He approached toward the throne, laid the bottle at the sultan's feet, and kissed the rich tapestry which covered his footstool, and then said, "'I have brought you, sir,' the healthful water which your majesty desired so much to keep among your other rarities in your treasury, but at the same time wish you such extraordinary health as never to have occasion to make use of it. After the prince had made an end of his compliment, the sultan placed him on his right hand, and then said to him, Son, I am very much obliged to you for this valuable present, as also for the great danger you have exposed yourself to upon my account, 
which I have been informed of by a magician who knows the fountain of lions. But do me the pleasure, continued he, to inform me by what address, or rather by what incredible power, you have been secured. Sir, replied Prince Ahmed, I have no share in the compliment your majesty is pleased to make me. All the honor is due to the fairy my spouse, whose good advice I followed. Then he informed the sultan what those directions were, and by the relation of this his expedition let him know how well he had behaved himself. When he had done, the sultan, who showed outwardly all the demonstrations of great joy, but secretly became more jealous, retired into an inward apartment, where he sent for the magician. The magician, at her arrival, saved the sultan the trouble to tell her of the success of Prince Ahmed's journey, which she had heard of before she came, and therefore was prepared with an infallible means, as she pretended. This means she communicated to the sultan, who declared it the next day to the prince, in the midst of all his courtiers, in these words. Son, said he, I have one thing more to ask of you, after which I shall expect nothing more from your obedience nor your interest with your wife. This request is, to bring me a man not above a foot and a half high, and whose beard is thirty feet long, who carries a bar of iron upon his shoulders of five hundred weight, which he uses as a quarterstaff. Prince Ahmed, who did not believe that there was such a man in the world as his father described, would gladly have excused himself. But the sultan persisted in this demand, and told him the fairy could do more incredible things. The next day, the prince returned to his dear Padabanu, to whom he told his father's new demand, which, he said, he looked upon to be a thing more impossible than the first two, for, added he, I cannot imagine there can be such a man in the world, without doubt he has a mind to try whether or no I am so silly as to go about it, or he has a design on my ruin. In short, how can he suppose that I should lay behold of a man so well armed, though he is but little? What arms can I make use of to reduce him to my will? If there are any means, I beg you will tell them, and let me come off with honor this time. Don't affright yourself, prince, replied the fairy. You ran a risk in fetching the water of the fountain of lions for your father, but there's no danger in finding out this man who is my brother, Shaibar. But is so far from being like me, though we both have the same father, that he is of so violent a nature that nothing can prevent him giving cruel marks of his resentment for a slight offense, yet on the other hand is so good as to oblige anyone in whatever they desire. He is made exactly as the sultan your father has described him, and he has no other arms than a bar of iron of five hundred pounds weight, without which he never stirs, and which makes him respected. I'll send for him, and you shall judge of the truth of what I tell you. But be sure to prepare yourself against being frightened at his extraordinary figure when you see him. What? My queen, replied Prince Ahmed. Do you say Shaibar is your brother? Let him... Be never so ugly or deformed, I shall be so far from being frightened at the sight of him, that, as our brother, I shall honor and love him. The fairy ordered a gold chafing dish to be set with a fire in it under the porch of her palace, with a box of the same metal, which was a present to her, out of which, taking a perfume and throwing it into the fire, there arose a thick cloud of smoke. Some moments after, the fairy said to Princess Ahmed, "'See, there comes my brother.' The prince immediately perceived Shaibar coming gravely with his heavy bar on his shoulder, his long beard which he held up before him, and a pair of thick mustachios which he tucked behind his ears and almost covered his face. His eyes were very small and deep-set in his head, which was far from being of the smallest size, and on his head he wore a grenadier's cap. Besides all this, he was very much hump-backed. If Prince Ahmed had not known that Shaibar was Parabanu's brother, he would not have been able to have looked at him without fear. But knowing first who he was, he stood by the fairy without the least concern. Shaibar, as he came forward, looked at the prince earnestly enough to have chilled his blood in his veins, and asked Parabanu when he first accosted her who that man was, to which she replied, "'He is my husband, brother. His name is Ahmed. He is son to the Sultan of the Indies.' The reason why I did not invite you to my wedding was I was unwilling to divert you from an expedition you were engaged in, and from which I heard with pleasure you returned victorious, and so took the liberty now to call for you. At these words, Shaibar, looking on Prince Ahmed favorably, said, Is there anything else, sister, wherein I can serve him? It is enough for me that he is your husband to engage me to do for him whatever he desires. 
"'The sultan, his father,' replied Parabanu, "'has a curiosity to see you, "'and I desire he may be your guide to the sultan's court. "'He needs but lead me the way I'll follow him.' "'Brother,' replied Parabanu, "'it is too late to go today. "'Therefore stay till tomorrow morning, "'and in the meantime I'll inform you "'of all that has passed between the sultan of the Indies "'and Prince Ahmed since our marriage.' The next morning, after Shaibar had been informed of the affair, he and Prince Ahmed set out for the sultan's court. When they arrived at the gates of the capital, the people no sooner saw Shaibar but they ran and hid themselves, and some shut up their shops and locked themselves up in their houses, while others, flying, communicated their fear to all they met, who stayed not to look behind them but ran too. Insomuch that Shaibar and Prince Ahmed, as they went along, found the streets all desolate till they came to the palaces where the porters, instead of keeping the gates, ran away too, so that the prince and Shaibar advanced without any obstacle to the council hall where the sultan was seated on his throne and giving audience. Here, likewise, the ushers, at the approach of Shaibar, abandoned their posts and gave them free admittance. Shaibar went boldly and fiercely up to the throne without waiting to be presented by Prince Ahmed and accosted the Sultan of the Indies in these words. "'Thou hast asked for me,' said he. "'See, here I am. What wouldst thou have with me?' The Sultan, instead of answering him, clapped his hands before his eyes to avoid the sight of so terrible an object, at which uncivil and rude reception Shaibar was so much provoked, after he had given him the trouble to come so far, that he instantly lifted up his iron bar and killed him before Prince Ahmed could intercede in his behalf. All that he could do was to prevent his killing the Grand Wazir, who sat not far from him, representing to him that he had always given the Sultan his father good advice. "'These are they, then,' said Shaibar, who gave him bad, and as he pronounced these words he killed all the other Wazirs and flattering favorites of the Sultan who were Prince Ahmed's enemies. Every time he struck he killed someone or other, and none escaped but they who were not so frightened as to stand staring and gaping, and who saved themselves by flight. When this terrible execution was over, Shaibar came out of the council hall into the midst of the courtyard with the iron bar upon his shoulder, and, looking hard at the Grand Wazir who owed his life to Prince Ahmed, he said, I know here is a certain magician who is a greater enemy of my brother-in-law than all these base favorites I have chastised. Let the magician be brought to me presently. The Grand Wazir immediately sent for her, and as soon as she was brought, Shaibar said at the time he fetched a stroke at her with his iron bar, Take the reward of thy pernicious counsel and learn to feign sickness again. After this, he said, This is not yet enough. I will use the whole town after the same manner if they do not immediately acknowledge Prince Ahmed, my brother-in-law, for their sultan and the sultan of the Indies. Then all that were there present made the air echo again with the repeated acclamations of, Long life to Sultan Ahmed, and immediately after he was proclaimed through the whole town. Shaibar made him be clothed in the royal vestments, installed him on the throne, and after he had caused all to swear homage and fidelity to him, went and fetched his sister Parabanu, whom he brought with all the pomp and grandeur imaginable, and made her to be owned sultaness of the Indies. As for Prince Ali and Princess Naranahar, as they had no hand in the conspiracy against Prince Ahmed, and knew nothing of any, Prince Ahmed assigned them a considerable province with its capital, where they spent the rest of their lives." Afterwards, he sent an officer to Prince Hossein to acquaint him with the change and make him an offer of which province he liked best. But that prince thought himself so happy in his solitude that he bade the officer return the sultan his brother thanks for the kindness he designed him, assuring him of his submission, and that the only favor he desired of him was to give him leave to live retired in the place he had made choice of for his retreat. The End Read by Rick Kushner for Lit to Go.